Hey, this is Rod Pika, and you're watching Time to Connect. Hey, Rod Pika, how are you doing, man? I'm doing just fine, just rolling along. Yeah, man, thank you so much for taking the time to connect. I appreciate you doing this. I believe you are, are you coming to us from Houston? Yeah, from Houston right this second. Yeah, yeah. Not for long, but. <laughs> yeah, you've, uh, uh, this episode will go out later, but but today you are, you've got a gig at a good old Mucky Duck tonight, as I understand. Yeah, Mucky Duck, and then tomorrow up in Austin, and up in Fort Worth, and back to Austin for a house concert. It's a it's a real short run, but, uh -huh. you know, uh, I think everybody's having short runs of shows right now. <laughs> it's still, still not quite back from, from COVID, almost back, but. Not yeah, cool. yeah, we, we sure seem to be back. How was, speaking of that, how was the pandemic for you? I know for those of us who like to play live music, it was, it was tough, but, but it's, it's interesting how many people I talk to say, man, it was great for me in a lot of ways. It was obviously a horrible thing that a lot of people were sick and died, but, um, but I kind of enjoy the chill time. How, how about you? How was it for you? You know, it was, it was a mix and it was a funny kind of serendipity to it because for the last few years, uh, for the few years before the before the COVID lockdown, I was saying to myself, "Man, I I really need a year off, or I need you know I need maybe six months, even three months. I just need to stop, st get off the hamster wheel for a minute." Uh, and then, of course, we we got in lockdown, and I realized the implications of what that meant was that you know I had to kind of reinvent how I made a living because uh, I've been a road dog for, you know, 25 years, 23 years. And um, so it was a mixed blessing. You know, I was um, I was able to spend a lot of time with my father, um, who's, you know, obviously elderly. And um, so that, that was great. That was nice. And I was able to help him through the, the passing of my mother. And, uh, uh, you know, I got to do some interesting projects during that time you know i made made cds for people like you know recorded i had to re i had to reinvent how i made a living so i had to come up with different ideas so you know one of the things that i did was record these bespoke cds for people so they would send me their 10 favorite songs and i would record them and talk to them while they did it all just all in one track you know that's beautiful yeah it was fun it was really fun uh it was very intimate and then i made a I made a recording of all the songs that Slade Cleves and I have wrote, written together over the years. And uh, I put sort of, it was a real limited edition. Mm -hmm. And uh, that did really well. People were real supportive of that. I, we wrote this really nice booklet out and, and uh, that, came, that comes with the CD. And it's a, you know, it's a, it's a lot of songs. So <laughs> are, are you are, uh, speaking of uh, Wood, Steel, Dust and Dreams there? Are you sticking to your guns on that uh, limited edition? You're, it's 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 done. Yeah, I mean, I I looked at uh, I looked at my merch before I left uh, for this little short tour, and uh, geez, I think I might have twenty copies left. Or, and uh, yeah, I'm sticking to my guns, just like I did with the live album years ago. Mm -hmm. It's fun. It makes it hard for people to get after a while, you know. They have to they have to find it on eBay or. They have well, to search, it, search it, for it. They end up on Discogs for about eight hundred dollars. <laughs> unfortunately, well, man, there's a lot of questions I want to ask you. I want to respect your time um, here, but I want to ask you. Uh, you mentioned you're a you're a road dog. I know you've been been on the road for many years, and I hope you you've got a few fun road stories for us. Want to want to talk about uh, some of your records? I know you've got a bunch of them out there. Your uh, collaboration with Slade, and and I've got a lot of other questions for you, but let's start, if you don't mind, with a little biographical information. I will have put show notes uh, on here with links so people can find out about you, but maybe just a little potted biography. What uh, you know, who is Rod Picot? How did you get to where you are today? Well, the, I mean, the route I took was, I guess you know, I suppose like a lot of people, it was sort of circuitous. You know, I grew up in. Uh, uh, I was born in New Hampshire, grew up in Maine, very rural. Um, you know, Maine is sort of an isolated place in a, in a way because, you know, it doesn't have f surrounding states all around the border. You know, it's got a huge, it's got a huge uh, uh, 
uh, part of it is against the ocean and then Canada and, and, uh, you know, border with New Hampshire and that's about it. Mm -hmm. So it was a, it was a, it was a place where it was hard to get information about music. And luckily enough, there was a really powerful, uh, FM freeform FM radio station in Boston called WBCN. That was a real powerhouse, you know, probably one of the 10 most important FM stations back in the day of freeform FM radio. Mm -hmm. And, um, and it just reached our town, you know, like if you went north, just yeah. one town, it faded out. But so that was my connection to music. You know, that's how I discovered new music. So, you know, that's how I discovered the clash and the pretenders and Springsteen and Steve Earle and all the things that I listened to and all the things that influenced me. And, uh, I moved to Colorado when I was about 25 and, um, I just accidentally, you remember when people used to put out flyers with their phone number, you know, like looking for a bass player or whatever, and yes. rip, you'd rip off the phone number. Yeah. 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 So, so this, this thing was hanging on a telephone pole and it said it was a songwriting workshop. And I thought, geez, you know, I'm really, I'm working hard at, at, at uh, trying to figure out songwriting. And, uh, I thought maybe this would be a little shortcut. You know, I can learn something from whoever this guy is. I didn't, didn't know who he was or anything, but so I ripped the tab off and I called and took the workshop and it was just great. You know, I don't think the guy liked me very much. I was kind of the, the one is. <laughs> and now was this in Colorado? Yeah, this was in Colorado, Boulder, Colorado. And I'm about 24 years old, I guess, uh, maybe 25. And, um, but I, you know, I just really wanted to like soak in all the information that I could get from, from this guy. Cause he was a fantastic songwriter, great singer, uh, uh, you know, interesting guy, had great stories. And, uh, somehow I got it in my head that I could be a, you know, get a publishing deal. I don't think anybody else thought that. But <laughs> so I went to Nashville, just sight unseen. I just, you know, I'd never been there, packed everything up into my S10 blazer and uh drove to nashville and uh you know rented a, a little duplex and got a job in a couple of days and i was there wow yeah, yeah that that was bold been, and in there and since 94. Your family, what'd your family think about that at the time did they think what are you doing man <laughs> oh it's the you know it's that same old story of you know my parents were worried about me when i was when i was obsessed with music and sure you know they thought well, that's something you can do on the weekends, you know, but you really need to be an electrician at the shipyard. <laughs> <laughs> that's really what you need to do. Yeah, yeah. But I was, I was too far gone. I was too deep in there. You know, yeah. I was, I was obsessed. Like, like everybody else who ends up making a living doing it, you know, you just, you have to be obsessed. Yeah. Who were some of those, uh, you mentioned a couple of the bands, uh, you listened to as a kid, uh, who are some of the folks that you think of now? who probably influenced you to be a songwriter uh, more than any others. Uh, is Dylan in that, on that list? Yeah. I mean, it would be, I think, you know, initially when I was a young kid, when I was maybe 10 or 11 years old, I was into, you know, whatever was available and what, what was available was pretty limited, you know? So I heard Led Zeppelin and I love Led Zeppelin. I heard Elton, the early Elton John stuff, which was great. Mm -hmm. And, um, but then when they, when it got to the era of, I started discovering like singer songwriters who fronted a band. Mm -hmm. So I still had the, the band thing, which I loved, you know, I had the rock and roll element, but it had a real writer at the front. You know, it wasn't grand funk. It was Jackson Brown, Tom yeah. Petty, Bruce yeah. Springsteen, Steve Earle, a little bit later on, Steve Earle. James Taylor. Yeah. yeah. But, you know, singer songwriters who fronted a band and, but were really writers, you know? Um, and that, that was a big sea change for me. That was a big, you know, that's where I went from listening to the Jay Giles band, which was a, you know, great rock and roll R and B band to listening to things that were a lot darker and maybe a, a little more dense in terms of songwriting, you know, it wasn't about the party. It was a story being told. Mm -hmm. And that's what really, that's where I really got hooked. Well, mm -hmm. when I, when I stumbled across all these people that were really telling stories, writing stories. And this must've been after I heard, heard you talk about you and Slade had a kind of a garage band when you were kids. Yeah, we did. And, <laughs> 
uh, I've heard you say it was pretty terrible. <laughs> oh, we were awful. I mean, yeah. We were, you know, we were 14 and 15 years old. I mean, we were, we were just kids, you know, just learning our instruments. Um, uh -huh. uh, Slade was a was a very good singer, uh, just naturally. But he didn't sing in that band. We didn't even knew we didn't even none of us even knew he sang. He played wow. this little far, Farfisa organ. You know, it just sound, sounded terrible. And uh, <laughs> I wish there were videos of this. <laughs> there's a uh, there's a there's one single cassette tape uh, that I that I have of a show that we did uh, at the elementary school, and uh, it's very funny to look back on because. Even even then, you know, at 14 years old, like we were not interested in, in pleasing people. We played what we wanted to play. Like we played the songs that we loved. You know, we'd do a version of Springsteen's Stolen Car that was seven minutes long, you know. We were not interested in playing, not that there's anything wrong with it, but like the classic rock of the day, you know, Billy Squire and uh, Foreigner and, yeah. you know, you know that. Ernie. Yeah. yeah, just the, you know, standard FM rock, the classic rock uh -huh. of the day. We were not interested in that. We were interested in the Stones and the Beatles and Springsteen and the Clash. Yeah. Even more obscure stuff like like Jim Carroll. You know, we did a version of Those Are People Who Died, you know. Okay. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So we had, we had a kind of, I suppose we kind of, in a way we had a sort of a punk ethos without really realizing we had a punk ethos, you know, nice. but we only, we only played what we wanted to play and, and, uh, it was a great, great fun. You know, it was a great learning experience. So what were you like as a kid? Hmm. Complicated. I was very, very shy. Uh, when I was young, I was very verbal. Uh, you know, I started reading when I was not even three years old. Um, so I had sort of a, but I was very shy and I was very, um, very sensitive. And uh, the environment that I grew up in was pretty, pretty hard, pretty, pretty hard, you know, very working class, very blue collar. Um, you know, I remember we lived in the projects at one point when I was just a little kid. You know, we lived in government housing until my father <laughs> put the beer down for a minute. <laughs> mm -hmm. And he was a tough guy. You know, my dad was a tough guy. He's a good man, but very, a very, you know, he came from a different era and he was, a, he was a tough guy. I, I always say he looked, you know, he looked at me like I was, you know, like I was a pink hammer. <laughs> like he was thinking, well, I'll keep it, but I'd rather have a different one. <laughs> wow. Well, and, and how old were you when you started thinking of yourself as an artist? It was probably in that environment was not the easiest thing to think of yourself as. No, it was very difficult, but I was very, very stubborn. You know, I, I, I knew who I knew who I was and what I thought about the world and what I thought about what I thought about people and, uh, I was very free with expressing my thoughts and, and kind of, even though I was very sensitive and shy, I just had this kind of like, I had a feeling that I saw stuff that wasn't things that weren't being addressed, you know, in the family and in the, in the, in the household mm -hmm. and I could see it, you know, and you couldn't, it was one of those houses where you couldn't talk about stuff. Nothing ever got talked out, you know? Yeah. And, uh, but I was, I was, yeah, I was very aware, you know, I was the kids standing in the corner watching the room happen. Uh, this person is like, the, I can see something maneuvering going on here. And uh -huh. Uh -huh. so I was, I was quite aware looking back now, I can see that I was, I was very, very aware watching, watching the world. And, and of course that all now becomes grist for the mill and your songwriting for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and I want to ask you about your songwriting. Uh, you've got. Is it 14 albums you have out? Something like that? I think that's the total, but that includes a couple, you know, a live album and a duo record and a, and the thing that I did with all of the Slate Cleaves co-writes. So yeah, I think and, that makes 14. And uh, I hope you're working on a new one right now. I am. We're about to start in uh, the end of June, beginning of July. Good deal. Um, before I ask you specific about your songwriting, which I want to do, um, a couple of interesting questions. Well, I hope hope you'll find them interesting. 
I know you've collaborated with Slade. I'm not sure who else you've co-written with, but who would who comes to mind if I said who would you like to write with that you haven't written with? Well, <laughs> who would I like to write with that I haven't written with? Um, I've written with some really amazing writers. I wrote, you know, a few times with Fred Eagle Smith. Nice. I, I probably learned more writing with Fred. The first day I wrote with Fred, I probably learned more about songwriting than I did uh, from with everything else combined. You know? Wow. wow. He, he was he was quite amazing. He he walked in, you know, he walked in the door and he said, Do you mind being the guy with the pencil? <laughs> <laughs> I said, No, that's fine. That's cool. Okay. He said, I'm just gonna walk around and say stuff and you just write it all down. At the end yeah. of the day, we'll have a song. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But Fred was great because he made me. I'll, I'll I'll answer your question in one second. But sure, Fred sure. Fred was specifically great because he made me think of. He asked questions like this. He would say, "Does this song take place in one room? Uh, is this song a narrative? Is there a story here, uh -huh. or is it a moment? Uh -huh. Is it a feeling? Uh -huh. Is it me or you laying on the bed in the middle of the night, missing somebody with uh -huh. the windows open?" Yeah. Is it one play, you know, who is this person? And we kind of, that's how we wrote. And, um, you know, we got a great song out of it called Getting to Me. And um, it's one of the few co-writes, I think. Slate, uh, Fred has co-written a lot, but I think it's one of the few co-writes he's ever recorded. Um, and I, I recorded it as well. But if I, if I could pick one person, you know, it's a ridiculous, it's a ridiculous answer, but I, it would have to be Springsteen. Okay. specifically nebraska era springsteen mm -hmm. um which i think is just really his masterpiece as a songwriter as a writer mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah I don't know, for some reason jason isbell came to mind and i don't know that jason's doing much co-writing but i i think it'd be a really fascinating thing that would come out of you two getting together and writing i'd love to write with jason he didn't need the help though <laughs> <laughs> right yeah. yeah i hear that um Okay, a similar question. Who have you never shared a stage with that you would like to share a stage with? Oh, I'd love to open a I'd love to open a show for Jason. I, right. I, I really I really would. Um, yeah, I think his audience would get what I do. Yeah. Um, and I think it I think it would be a good opener too, because, you know, what I do is is, you know, just me and the guitar, maybe one, maybe one other person. So it would, you know, it would launch into his full band thing very elegantly uh, you know I, and i've opened so many shows for so many people over the years that i i do kind of i i kind of pride myself on having the skill of being a good opener you know which is never go past your time if you've got 34 minutes uh, 35 minutes do 34 mm -hmm. you know and make just make the most of the time that you have and and be grateful and you know always remember that it's not your show you're not there to win something. You're there to you're there to make people excited to hear the main act. That's your job, you know. And so, I kind of I do kind of pride myself on knowing how to be a, be a good opening act. That's beautiful, uh, man. That's beautiful. It, it it reminds me of something that I've been. Uh, I'm a recently retired university professor, and I've been trying to instill in my students for years that the magic combination is confident humility. Yeah, and I think that's what it takes to be a good opener. Yeah. 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 That's great. That's a great way to put it. You know, I mean, it's funny because, you know, false confidence announces itself. Yeah. Real confidence doesn't have to announce itself. It's just, it's just there. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And uh, so that's a, that's a nice way. That's a nice way of describing that. Right on. Um, one more kind of what if question uh, that I kind of enjoy. And, and maybe you can correct me on this, but I, I think I remember that back in the day in Nashville, one of the things that Guy Clark used to do with young songwriters, uh, he could be a pretty intimidating presence and, and he would, <laughs> he would say, you know, catch them just at the moment when they were sort of vulnerable and say, play me your best song. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And, and, and that had to be a nerve wracking moment. And then he would say, play, and now play, play me one cover. And oh, and, interesting. And so I always think about that, and it could be Guy, but you know, my guy is Dylan. So you you pick whoever it is, somebody who intimidates you. And let's say Bob Dylan knocked on your hotel door right now and said, uh, 
uh, hey, Rod, I, I hear you're a, a songwriter. Play me one of your songs. What would you play for Bob? I'd play a song called Haunted Man from my first relic, first album. Yeah, it's probably the best thing I've ever written. Okay, man. Okay. What cover would you play? I'd probably play uh, something from... Uh, I'd probably play Badlands from Darkness on the Edge of Town. Okay. I have an acoustic version of Badlands that I, I think is quite nice. Okay. Are you going to play either one of those songs tonight? Yeah, I'm going to play. I think I'll play Badlands tonight. It's on the set list, but you know, I I make a set list, so, you know, out of for comfort. Yes. But I, I pr pretty quickly abandon the set list. Um, yeah. You know, I'll sort of look down through and I'll go, no, nah, that's not that's not feeling. I'm not feeling that song right now. I might come back to it, but mm -hmm. um, you know, it's nice to have a little. It's just nice to have the guideposts there for you. Uh, so you can get started and then you can kind of take, once you get comfortable, you can take over yourself. And so, yeah. Yeah. And, and that's a good stage to do it. Mucky, Mucky Duck. I really enjoy that venue and it. It really is a listening room, which, yeah, which we, we don't, seems like we don't have as many of those around anymore, but, um, so let's talk, if you don't mind a little bit about your songwriting. Um, do you, Okay, first of all, kind of cliche, do you typically, I know it probably varies, but do you typically start with an idea? Do you start with lyrics? Do you start with a chord progression? Do you start with a melody? How does it usually or often come to you? You know, I've thought about, because it, it is a common question, but I, I have a very specific answer for this. I feel that the best songs that come to you kind of come, it's almost like you put up an antenna and you're looking, you're open, you know, your mind is open, looking for something. You're always listening to people talk. You're listening to language. You're listening to little phrases that are interesting, you know, um, things that are regional, you know, and very specific. Uh, but to me, usually the best songs, you get a piece of the whole thing at the same time. You sort of hear the chord progression, you hear a melody, and you hear maybe a couple of lines. Um, and, uh, and so <laughs> the answer is everything, you know, yeah. like those are the best songs because there's something, there's something natural, there's something so natural about all of that coming at the same time that is really hard to do with just tools, you know, say, I'm going to write a song right now yeah. and, uh, I'm picking a topic and here I go and I've got my chisel out and you're chiseling away you might end up with something really good but you're probably not going to end up with something great because it's not coming from a place of 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 true discovery and inspiration mm -hmm. you know what you want is you want those you want those first couple of lines that just make the hairs on your arms stand up and you you think shit i got, I got something here i got something here i got to pull the car over i got to get the recorder on yeah. uh that's how it works for me yeah. and then you then you know you get as much as you can in that first that first fire you know that first forging of the song you just go you keep following it and following it you get as far as you can eventually you run out you're not going to get the whole song most likely mm -hmm. and then you then you have to get your tools out and right yeah. and, and sort of do the best you can with the rest of it i love that and and it is it is strange that it it feels like it's almost like you said, you put your antenna up, it's almost like you're discovering something rather than creating something. Um, but of course that you wouldn't discover it if you hadn't put in all the hard work and if you weren't right. constantly writing in your head and obsessed with this, this songwriting, obsessed with language. So I'm imagining uh, a, song, a song like Drunken Barber's Hand, that, that phrase I'll bet came first. That was Slade's song, actually. It oh, was, was it? That was that was a song that Slade brought to me that he couldn't he couldn't quite finish. It was pretty well finished. You know, I would say it was eighty five percent of the way there. Um, and so that was that was that was his phrase. I mean, he already had the title and everything, so he brought it, he brought it to me and just couldn't figure out a few lines. You know, so I mm -hmm. I kind of I just kind of jumped in on it, and that's sort of how we work. You know. One of us will get stuck on a song and just can't move it forward and bring it to the other guy and say, what do you, th you know, what do you think? Yeah. 90% of the time it works out every once in a while it doesn't, but, um, 
Yeah, most of the time, most of the time it works out. Bro broke down, similar, similar kind of thing. Bro Bro broke down was my song. Um, gotcha. uh, you know, my version of it has a slightly different lyric. Um, but Slade and I kind of have a gentleman's agreement about that stuff. Like we get it, we get the song ninety percent of the way there, and then if I want to go left and he wants to go right, we just allow each other that sort of grace of having two slightly different versions. Sometimes they're dead on. Sometimes they're exactly the same. And sometimes there's just, a, you know, a couple of lines that are that are different, or the melody might be slightly different. Do you remember what yeah. year you guys wrote that song? I wrote "Broke Down." I think in '95. Uh -huh. Okay. I think I think it came out on. I think his his album "Broke Down" came out in '99. Oh, two thousand. I think so. Okay. All right. I would have written it in 98 then okay i would have written it in 98 gotcha yeah i i had a, got a line the other day it's really strange where it just like you said your antenna's up and i and my my most recent song i've written completely came from the line and i have no idea where it came from the line is in a hospital gown in a hotel bar and <laughs> you get a line like that it's like okay here we go <laughs> you know, that's really go. good oh thanks man um Let's see. Uh, let me ask you about, and we could go on forever about this one, but we'll have a maybe a quick conversation about where music is these days with respect to streaming and and you know Spotify and 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 uh, how difficult it is. I mean, there's a lot of things that make it so much easier to make music now. I mean, anybody can make music, and consequently, there's a lot of bad music out there, but. Yeah. But even even you know someone like yourself, if you want to, you just totally self produce and put it out, and and it's relatively easy compared to the way it used to be. And yet, there's so many downsides to this, the whole streaming and the whole industry. Do you have, without you know spending a whole hour on this, any particular thoughts you have about the state of the music business right now? Um, I hate it. <laughs> I can't imagine being you know. I mean, I was 35 when I put my first uh album out you know obviously in cd format and it was you know it was a lot of work we worked really hard on it and everything but that's just a matter of your will you know that's if you're willing to work hard you work hard mm -hmm. but like you said you know the um the digital world is so much easier to work in and so much you know that's democratized making music but at the same time um I mean, the streaming thing, I absolutely hate. I just really hate it because, I mean, constantly, I'm just, you know, I'm from a different era. So I'm constantly, I'm standing there at the merch table and there's all these, you know, albums that I worked so hard on and uh, people are constantly coming up saying, you know, great show. I listen to you on Spotify all the time. And I think, thanks for the, uh, you know, one-tenth of a cent. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. Thanks for um, Giving Spotify your money. Yeah, I I mean, I, I released the last record, I last album I put out, Paper Hearts and Broken Arrows, which mm -hmm. honestly is probably one of the best three albums that I've, that I've made. Suddenly I was just really inspired and we kind of nailed it again. Um, I didn't put it on any streaming. I didn't do any streaming. Right. As, if you want it, you got to buy it from me. Yep. That's yeah. it. Yeah, you good know? for you, man. Good for you. I, I like that. Um, Again, this could be a one hour topic, but maybe just ask you to share a short story of maybe one of the funniest things that's happened to you as a as a road dog, as a road warrior. I know you've had some <laughs> really crazy things happen. Anything comes to mind if you're sitting around talking about funny things that have happened on the road? This is this is one of this is one of my favorites. Um so when I at the be very beginning of my career when I started touring I used to bring somebody with me you know a guitar player and I had this wonderful dobro player named Matt Motch we we're playing in Baltimore and uh this guy comes up to, we did the show went fine you know just a few people few people there to who knew who I was and you know were, were there to see me but it was fine yeah I was just getting started so this guy says uh do you have a place to stay I said, no, nah, nah, we, ha nah, we haven't figured it out yet. You know, this is the early years. So, like, yeah, we, we haven't even booked the hotel yet, you know. And uh, so we're packing up. And he says, well, you can, come, you, you can stay at my house. It's, if, you know, right close by if you want. I said, oh, you know, I, oh, geez, I don't know. You know, it felt a little weird. Didn't know the guy. He's like, uh, 
no, no, I'll be fine. You know, I'm, uh, here, I'll just give you the address and here's the directions. I'm, I'm going to go home now and, and uh, you guys just show up whenever you want to show up and, you know, I'll, I'll show you around and, and, and uh, he'll, he'll be fine. He was a really nice guy. And, uh, uh, you know, there was nothing weird about it. Didn't feel weird or anything. So we said, oh, all right, you know, that's great. You know, we'll save a hundred bucks on the hotel or whatever. 80 bucks, 80, 75 bucks at the time. So we drive over and we get there and we walk in and he's, you know, having a snack or something. He says, all right, well, uh, I'm going to go to bed. You know, I got to get up early, go to work. And so you guys just, you know, you know, have your, have your way with the place. And he goes off upstairs, you know, so we're downstairs and all there is is a kitchen and a living room. <laughs> and we're looking at the living room and we're looking at the sofa and kind of going, Hmm. Where, does, where does he think we're sleeping? Uh -huh. <laughs> and, uh, you know, Matt and I were good buddies, you know, so it was like no problem. But then we realized the sofa wasn't even a pull-out sofa. <laughs> so we, we looked around and there was a dog bed <laughs> over oh. in the, you know, one of those big round dog yeah, beds. Yeah. We were like, man, it's, it's <laughs> what we're flipping for the dog bed. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> so we we flipped a coin and Matt lost and he spent the night on the uh on one of those big circle dog beds. <laughs> yeah, he that's... never he never lets me forget it. <laughs> yeah, uh yeah, definitely uh there's a point at which when people are starting off that they're kind of like, okay, maybe I'll stay at this guy's place. There's oh, usually going to I won't book a hotel yet just in case, but and you don't have to get very old before you say, thanks, but I got a hotel. <laughs> I got it covered. Yeah. I'm all set. What do you like most living? What do you like most about living in Nashville? You know, I don't like living in Nashville anymore. You know? I'll, I'll be perfectly honest with you. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to lie. I loved the town when I first moved there. It was all about song. You know, um, it was intimidating. But it was all about song in a, in a good and, way, I guess. In a good way, yeah. I mean, yeah. I I felt when I moved there, and I don't mean this in a conceited way, but I felt like, okay, my peers now are Gillian Welch, John Prine, and Lucinda Williams, and Guy Clark. Yeah, but that's what I'm shooting for. Yeah, you know, I'm no longer trying to be the best guy at the open mic. Like the right. stakes are the stakes are raised. Yeah, and they're raised high. <laughs> Very high. <laughs> <laughs> putting a lot of chips in yeah and you know i saw i've seen it crush people um you know who just kind of couldn't grasp that level of ambition you know just in terms of the work of trying to get that good i've seen people crumble and it break you know it can it can be heartbreaking it can break people um but it was all about song and now nashville feels very much about the act you know what I mean? Like there's a lot of a lot of bands with suspenders and a banjo and a funny hat, you know, and yeah. Like it's kind of about the act or the production, the recording. Um, it does does not feel as much like it's a it's a it's a city about the song anymore. And uh that's very disappointing to me. Yeah. Um sounds even like though I still yeah. have heroes that live there you know isbel's i think isbel is one of the finest songwriters in the, of the you know of the last quarter century and uh you know he's there so yeah. you know there are still people there but it's it's changed obviously guy's gone now john's gone right um, yeah so have you had uh, any um uh, interactions with mary gaucher yeah, I know Mary fairly, fairly well. We used to go hiking once in a while, and uh, we used to have coffee once in a while. I haven't seen her in a few years now, but we used to get together, uh, you know, once or twice a year. And uh, There's a possible collab collaborative collaboration partner. I, can, I would enjoy seeing what you guys would come up with. Yeah, we tried a couple times, actually, and she's always, she's left an open invitation, you know, for to, to try again. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, we... We had a song, <laughs> we had a song almost, almost finished. And she called up and she was, Rod, I'm, I'm just not feeling this song. <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to have to jump off this one. <laughs> I was like, I okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. You know, I mean, you gotta do, gotta do what you gotta do if your heart's not in it. That's right. Yeah. 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 It's amazing sometimes when you hear people's songs who is that they don't think 
they don't they don't feel it and they don't think that I'm not going to release this one and you and you hear it and you go oh my god that's my favorite song of yours but you know that's yeah no accounting for taste all right man well listen I've I've already taken up a bunch of your time let's finish up if you don't mind with a a series of rapid fire questions all right I'm ready I'll, I'll be all right all right if not music what uh fiction yeah, and I didn't mention, I, I will mention in the show notes uh, that, that you're a poet and a short story writer. And, and, and I don't even want to bring that up now because we, it, that would be too long of a conversation. But uh, we'll definitely put that in the show notes and hopefully people will check that out. Um, if you ha- could only listen to one record for the next two weeks. Nebraska. Okay. Favorite venue. Um, it's a house concert in New Jersey run by a woman named Brenda Worth. It only holds 25 people. It's absolutely packed and your feet are right back up against the thing that holds the television and it's just glorious. Nice. nice yeah, it's nice. glorious. A, a book that you probably read multiple times, but that you would gladly read again. To Kill a Mockingbird. I read it every few years. Nice. Favorite film? Um, boy, that's a long list. Raging Bull comes to mind. Um, Cuckoo's Nest comes to mind. I think that for me, The Godfather, obviously, one and two. I consider them one film. Uh, um, I think there was a golden age of cinema, like from 67 to 75 or something like, so, you know, roughly in there. Because mm-hmm. you, you think back at that time, you had The Graduate and you had, you know, Little Big Man. And you had, it was a, just an amazing time. And music was like that too. I mean, it was cool. It was just like people were, yeah, people were inventing things, you know? Yeah. 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 Right on. Pet, any pet peeves? Anything that kind of pisses you off or that? I mean, uh, probably a lot of things if you're like me, but anything that comes to mind? <laughs> um, sound men who think they know how you're supposed to sound. Okay. And it's, it's different from how you know that you're supposed to sound. <laughs> yeah. 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 So that, can be, that can be a delicate dance. Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, any guilty pleasures? Something that might surprise people, even people who know you a little bit, say, really? I didn't know that about Rod. Uh, you know, I mean, I suffer from, I suffer from a bit of depression from time to time, like a lot of people do, you know, like a lot, a lot of people suffer from that. And I go through periods where I'm, it's quite dark and I'll watch, uh, romantic comedies. Okay. (laughs) Like just, just trash films, you know, like Notting Hill and, you know, Love Actually and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah, Those, I mean, it's definitely a guilty pleasure. And, and it's horribly cliche as it is laughter is good medicine you know yeah there's something about the sweetness that calms me when i'm you know when i'm kind of roiling in my head there's something about the sim- simplicity and the calmness of those films the sweetness do you have any other uh do you meditate or do you have any other practices for for dealing with the slings and arrows of <laughs> my uh therapist has me meditating yeah so I do, I do i do meditate but it's fairly new to me so it's a, huh. it's um i don't find it easy to quiet my head it, it's it's not easy man and and, I, and i've been practicing for many many years and and i teach meditation and and that's one of there's so many misconceptions but one of the biggest misconceptions is oh this is hard people expect it of course it's hard yeah people expect it to be easy uh, i heard uh, a meditation teacher talking about uh, he said he saw a report that came out from i think it was oxford or someplace that said 33 percent of beginning meditators have a difficult time so, it's only 33%. Come on, man. It's 90%. It's 99%. It's a hard thing to do. But uh, yeah, it's it, there's a reason it's become kind of popular in our culture these days, because this culture of distraction and stress and busyness is just overwhelming for most people. It is overwhelming. The 24 hour news cycle. Of course, yeah. that's that's been going on for a long time now. But yeah. just the barrage of information and I, visuals and you know audio that we're that we're just pummeled with uh yeah. constantly yeah. makes it hard to shut your brain down yeah yeah um okay man two more questions uh you know jack kerouac famously said when he was asked why he wrote on the road he said because we're all going to die and and that's probably a pretty good answer to why we do a lot of what we do 
Uh, do you do you think much about you know the 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 finitude of this life and maybe what happened? Do you have any ideas of what happens after we die? Do you think we live on in some way, or do you think that's it, or is this a question that troubles you? It's a, um, I mean, it's a great question. I don't feel like I have any. I don't feel like I have any instinct for what happens after we're gone. I really don't. I think it could be absolutely nothing. You just, you know, your the energy of your body is just feeding the soil, or there could be some other dimension that, you know, mm -hmm. as as hippie as that sounds, you know. Yeah. And I think here's what I think. I think it's incredibly arrogant for anybody to say this is what happens because yeah. the fact is nobody walking around knows right. and for all the people you know they're you know millions and hundreds of millions of people that believe one thing there's another billion people who believe something else you know so right. I, don't, I don't see i just don't see how i just don't see how anybody could can make that claim of knowing what happens yeah it's i think easy. one of the secrets is to be okay with not knowing yeah, hold open that possibility, and and even though it's a question that has been troubling humans for millennia, to to it's not that you say I don't care or who you know why does it matter, but it's sort of like yeah I, I don't know uh, I I can't know and and I'm okay with that, and I, I also I think it makes every moment here a little more precious when we we remind ourselves of that fact. Uh, one of the best answers I heard to that was was actually Ben Affleck, and he said. Uh, but I think I, I think I know what's going to happen when we die. I think a lot of people are going to miss us. <laughs> That's great. I like that uh, answer because it's uh, not about you. It's yeah, about loops. You. Yeah, loops around. Yeah. Yeah. All right, man. Last question. If you could, speaking of that, if you could write your own epitaph, what would your what would your gravestone say? Here lies Rod. Uh, he worked hard. Yeah. Yeah. You clearly do, man. You clearly do, and. Uh, keep putting records out and um, looking forward to the next record. And uh, I, I really hope to get out to see you. I'm going to try to get down to Houston tonight to see you. I, it's not looking good, but I definitely want to catch you sometime. And I really, really appreciate you doing this. Oh, I appreciate you having me. Thanks very much. Thanks very much. And I'll, I'll, catch, I'll catch you at some point. Right on. Thank you. Take All care. Bye-bye. Right.